My man, Russ. What's going on, sir? Good to see you, man. Good to see Good you. Good to see you, too. Got Kingdom Hearts 2. Oh, yes. I know it's been four years. We're waiting for this. Oh, Nate, play day. Let's not waste any more time. Let's put this pop the shit oh, in. Oh, yeah. Let's just go let's for just it. Let's go for it. This isn't Traverse Town. Where is this taking place at? No, no. Uh, this is Twilight Town. It was, it was mentioned at the end of the last game. Twilight Town. There, there was no Twilight Town in Kingdom Hearts 1. No. Uh, it, a Chain of Memories. Chain of Memories? Is that in Kingdom Hearts 1? Oh, shit. John, who are these guys in the Black Hoods? That's Organization 13. They were, Organization. The, they were, the, bad, they were the bad guys of the last game. They all weren't on Kingdom Hearts 1 either. No. Weren't Sora, Donald, and Goofy going to the castle? Where didn't Pluto bring them? Where's Pluto? Where's the letter? Where, where did they go? John, who's the blonde haired chick that looks exactly like Kyrie? It seems like this guy in the red hair is really important. Like, why does he keep showing up? Who's this guy in the deep voice that sounds like Christopher Lee over and over talking? Hey, John, it, your TV is, it, 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 it's staticky. Is it okay? Like, what's, what's going on? What, what is Sora doing in the Peapod thing? Chain of memories, Russ. They're all inserted. Chain of memories. Jesus, fuck anime. Looks like my summer vacation is over. That was the intro? Yep, that's pretty much how my first experience with Kingdom Hearts 2 went down, acting as the liaison for Chain of Memories, because like I said in the previous video, people didn't think it'd be important enough to get a Game Boy Advance for, they decided to skip it, and oh look at that, now they're lost. I'll admit, even in 2004, the idea of jumping from the PlayStation 2 to the Game Boy Advance was weird, but I did have a Game Boy Advance, I just had to, needed my Metroid, Pokemon, and Mario and Luigi fixings. And I played so much of the original Kingdom Hearts that I wanted more of that, and from what I saw in the trailers, it looked like more of the action I loved, only in 2D, and off the bat, I like to compliment the sprite quality. The sound may be hit and miss, but the game looks great, especially if you're playing on an actual Game Boy Advance SP model or wide, where it looks more fluid and crisp. My first run of Chain of Memories was very scattered. There were qualities I enjoyed, but a lot left me either confused or wanting and not in a good sort of way. And it took me a bit to even finish it. I picked it up in late 2004, but didn't fully complete it until late summer of 2005. And for the record, this game isn't that long. It has two campaigns, but they're both shorter than the original game. In March of 2007, as part of the initially Japan-only Kingdom Hearts 2 Final Mix Plus Combo Pack, <coughs> Square Enix went and remade the entirety of Kingdom Hearts Chain of Memories for the PlayStation 2, which, you know, kind of what it should have been in the first place that they really wanted us to play for the story. This new version, titled Kingdom Hearts Re-Chain of Memories, would see an international release in late 2008, so finally dedicated PlayStation 2 owners got to experience the missing piece of this slowly mutating puzzle just around four years after the game originally came out, and when Kingdom Hearts 2 was already a thing. For this video, I'm going to be looking at both versions. One, because the Game Boy Advance version was the one I played first, so I got some history with it. And secondly, the remake is the most relevant. It's the version included in all the HD compilations, so if you want the original, you're still going to need a Game Boy Advance and a physical copy of the... Oh, Jesus. Elliot, this is not your... Co this is my copy. Why did mom feel the need to mark her name with such a huge-ass sharpie? Oh, God. Oh, well. The story continues with Kingdom Hearts Chain of Memories. And I'll be using Re-Chain of Memories cutscenes for storytelling, since visually they're much much cleaner than the Game Boy Advance's oof, compressed videos. Good lord. Hey, it was ambitious at least, so I'll give them that. At the end of the last story, Sora, Donald, and Goofy managed to vanquish Anthem, the Seeker of Darkness, and prevent him from claiming the power of Kingdom Hearts, located just beyond this Door of the Darkness. With the help of a reformed Riku and King Mickey, our heroes managed to close the door at the cost of being separated from their friends. Riku and Mickey locked themselves on the other side of the door, Kairi was taken back to the restored Destiny Islands, and Sora and the gang somehow ended up on this long and windy road. Having no idea where to begin their search for their lost friends, things seemed dour until Mickey's dog Pluto suddenly shows up with a letter the king's seal. With hopes high, the trio follow Pluto to parts unknown. Unfortunately, because I guess they couldn't keep up with the damn dog and because Pluto is an asshole, the gang stops their chase for the night and rests under the stars. Suddenly, Sora is then awakened by this mysterious black cloaked figure and with some vague rhetoric, the man goads Sora and company to follow him in this strange looking castle in the distance. Once inside, the mystery man welcomes them to Castle Oblivion and right there, the gang should have just fucking bailed. I'm sorry, would you stay in a hotel called Cameras in the Bathroom? No, you wouldn't. But Sora 
Sora and the gang stick around because they have a gut feeling that Riku and King Mickey are inside and because Pluto ain't around anymore, so fuck him. However, by simply being inside the castle, the gang have forgotten all of their abilities, as Donald finds out the hard way. In Castle Oblivion, to lose is to find, and to find is to lose, and all that other bullshit, it's basically a justification for Sora to start from square one for both this and Kingdom Hearts 2, and this won't be the first time this happens, trust me. The cloaked man beckons Sora to travel deeper into the castle to search for his missing friends, but to do so, Sora must abide by the rules of the castle. The man creates a deck of cards for Sora that represents his memories in this case, all the Disney worlds he's traveled in previously as well as Traverse Town and such. Proceeding deeper into the castle requires that Sora visit these reflections at every floor, and the further he travels, the more memories he'll lose, but he'll also come closer to discovering the truth. I'd personally just leave the castle, but since the gang is back to basics, I guess it's better than nothing, so climb the castle they do. The gist of Chain of Memories is Sora traveling higher up the castle and re-experiencing events from his past, though not quite as similar as before and the castle's pretty fucking picky on how this works. For instance, the first world Sora travels through is Traverse Town, and though the likes of Leon, Yuffie, and Aerith don't recognize Sora at first, given that they're really illusions and not the real thing, they eventually begin to remember Sora because of the strong ties to his heart, and this is the only time in the game this happens, because after this, in every other world, it's like Sora is meeting the other characters for the first time and vice versa. Now it's true that the further Sora travels, the more memories he loses, but did he and the gang lose all the memories of the Disney stuff as early as the second floor? I wish the story was a little clearer on that. But that's small potatoes compared to the the actual plot of Chain of Memories because all these revisits are somehow less significant than the Disney worlds of the first Kingdom Hearts. The man behind the cloak is revealed to be a pink haired pretty boy named Marluxia, representing this so called organization. I know it's actually Organization 13, but for now it's just called the organization. One step at a time here. Marluxia wishes to overthrow his superior and take control of the organization for himself, along with other organization members Larzine, a woman I'm certain has a constant hard on for torture, and Axel, a fiery redhead voiced by Quentin Flynn, who I can't see as anybody else other than Reno from Final Fantasy VII because they're almost the exact Exact same fucking character. Marluxia believes that Sora is the key <laughs> to helping him take over the organization and devises a plan to make him his slave. He forcefully enlists the help of this petite girl named Namine, who has the power to alter the memories of an individual or just make up new memories altogether. Though she is clearly against the whole idea, she slowly inserts herself into Sora's memories, manipulating the boy to remembering things that never happened and having him think of nothing but her, causing him to slowly drift away from his actual friends. Sora, meanwhile, continues to journey through the castle all while encountering members of the organization who proceed to cycle psychologically fuck with the boy, including having him battle against a fake Riku that has his own set of problems, and showing him places that he doesn't recall but somehow feel familiar to him. Honestly, it's a miracle the kid doesn't just break down and cry, but I suppose that's the strength of his heart, and despite things looking gloom, help unexpectedly arrives from Axel, who only pretended to be a part of Marluxia's plan to overthrow the organization, acting as a double agent for the organization. Axel sets Naminé free so that she can help set things straight, ultimately leading to a final confrontation between Sora and Marluxia. Marluxia is cut down to size, as much as you can cut with the giant key anyway, and afterwards Naminé claims that she can help Sora, Donald, and Goofy restore their memories back to normal since their heads are pretty much... But to do so, they need to sleep in this chamber for a whole year. Without hesitation, the gang head into the deep sleep, leaving Naminé with a whole year's work ahead of her. But Sora wasn't the only one who entered Castle Oblivion, for Riku has somehow managed to find his way inside, thanks to this mysterious voice that wakes him up from inside this, uh, Stoner's chamber. After the events of the first game, Riku has lost track of Mickey and has no idea where to go or what to do next. The voice leads Riku to the castle so that he can, well, let's just call it a cleansing journey because that's really the gist of Riku's story. Learning how to deal with the darkness in his heart and facing the repercussions of his actions in the first game, taking place before, during, and after Sora's story. At first, Riku wants to completely vanquish the darkness in his heart, but then slowly comes to terms with it as the adventure continues. He comes across a few more members of the organization, deals with them promptly, and he eventually reunites with King Mickey after he, I don't know, I guess he went on sabbatical? And then finally, thanks to the vague assistance of this living mummy named Diz, who turns out to be the mysterious voice aiding Riku through the whole thing, Riku is able to conquer the remnants of Amsom located deep within his heart and takes full control of his powers. With King Mickey back at his side and knowing Sora is resting safely to get his memory back, Riku and King Mickey head towards the unknown, to learn more about this so-called organization. But after the credits, we get a glimpse of this unknown boy staring into the sunset, and oh, we're gonna be seeing a lot more of that. Now here's the thing, Chain of Memories is sort of a rehash of the first Kingdom Hearts game with all the same Disney worlds to revisit. Now, there are plenty of original elements added to the mix, but they're just there to plant the seeds for the eventual Kingdom Hearts 2 on the PlayStation 2, a teaser in some fashion. The organization obviously being the biggest addition, they wear these black coats, they have an ominous presence about them, they clearly got an agenda, but we learn next to nothing about them. And barring Largazine and Axel, they have next to no personality, and they spend most of their time just standing around talking about how things are going. And this is supposed to be Nomura 
Moore's definition of interesting? God, no, I don't care about these guys. Hell, maybe that's why Marluxia wanted to take over because he got sick of everyone wasting their time sitting in dark rooms as well. For fuck's sake, Lexian, turn some fucking lights on. Concerning the organization's plan with Sora, everything is told between the Disney World Sora revisits. Much like the original game, the Disney stuff has little relevance to the main story. If they're not abridged retellings of their Kingdom Hearts 1 counterparts, which are already abridged retellings of their Disney films, wrap your head around that one, then they serve as nothing but to distract the player from the main narrative, and they try to have it both ways by giving each world an underlying theme concerning the concept of memories, but it is so clumsily handled in terms of writing that it does little to justify our reasoning for heading back to these locales, illusions or otherwise. The morals of the story in each world come off as more as <laughs> drug PSAs connected to the theme of Chain of Memories, and it's not like Sora learns from any of this because guess what? The more he travels, the more he forgets, and at the end of the day, his memory of Castle Oblivion is wiped clean just in time for Kingdom Hearts 2. Honestly, I think the writing in general is just bad. I mean, take a shot every time the word light, darkness, or heart is brought up with little explanation to their actual meanings. Take a shot every time someone asks a question and the response is something ripped straight out of the Cheshire Cat Super Bowl playbook. What is light? What is darkness? I think I can understand what they're getting at with the concept of the heart. Again, I think it helps if you think of it more as a soul. But these terms are thrown around so often that I swear they don't know what they're talking about. So everything is kept as vague as possible so that they don't have to explain anything. And I'm sorry, I checked out of this story so hard very early on. And if it wasn't the hand-fisted plot, it was the characterization. I do not like what they did to Sora in this story. Now, to be fair, he is being manipulated both physically and mentally with the whole memory thing, but it feels like he never stops to think and use some good old-fashioned logic at any point and assess the situation. Yeah, he's the hot-blooded teen, I get that, but he's also our central character, meaning I gotta put up with this shit throughout the whole quest. And at a couple of points, his total disregard for reality made me think, damn, this kid is dumb. And when I'm agreeing with Larzine and Mar Lucia in that regard, you know something's wrong. At least Riku's campaign is easier to digest, it's just a story of accepting oneself, dealing with the consequences of your actions and making the best out of it, to fully take control of their destiny. It's simple, but effective given the character in question, although it's still pretty rife with the overuse of the term darkness and the fact that Riku can sense stuff by smelling it? What, what, what is he smelling? Someone's body odor? But is it wrong to think I'm more interested in how Riku's story continues now as he and King Mickey begin their mission to learn more about the organization? It's funny how things turn around after one game. Again, I don't hate Sora, I thought the kid was just fine in the first story but I hated his thought process in this game. And I'm grateful that by the end of it, they hit the reset button because holy fuck. Chain of Memories is one of those oddballs where it's both important and unimportant at the same time. Without it, you lack the context needed for clarification on a couple of things. How Sora ended up where he was, the introduction to characters such as the organization and Naminé, including the reasons why some organization members are missing by the start of Kingdom Hearts 2, and finally the current whereabouts of Riku and King Mickey. At the same time, it's not like there's much in Chain of Memories that's actually developed besides Riku. The organization is just there, the Disney stuff hardly matters because it's all an illusion. There are more questions than answers because Chain of Memories at the end of the day is merely the setup for the next game while not being a good story on its own merits. And to get technical for a second here, the English dubbing needed some serious tweaks. You see, in the original Kingdom Hearts, they took the time to have the lip animations match the English lines, a meticulous effort, but one I think paid off. But seeing as this was a side project with half of the staff and budget most likely, they just had the actors and actresses match their timings with the Japanese dialogue, leading to very stilted deliveries at points and a shitload of awkward pauses. These memories you gave me, in my head, I know they're lies, but they still feel right. But Chain of Memories didn't just use cards as a means to, to travel to other worlds. In this title, gameplay is also dictated by the cards in your possession. At a glance, Chain of Memories may seem like the standard deal, using the Keyblade to strike an endless foray of Heartless down, gaining experience to increase your health or learn new abilities, and getting assistance from your two chums, Goofy with his assortment of shield abilities, and Donald with his emergency heals and total disregard for elemental weaknesses. Really? You're gonna cast fire magic on the guy that uses fire. I will eat you. However, this is merely an illusion as fake as the very worlds you travel in. To even execute a simple attack, you have to play the appropriate card. From the swing of your Keyblade, the variety of magic eventually at your disposal, Proposal. Summoning allies, both Disney and Final Fantasy related, and defensive abilities you require after defeating bosses, that all requires having the right card in your deck, which you can slowly build as you collect more cards in the overworld, or earn through finding treasure chests or purchasing in Moogle shops. But cards cost card points to even place inside the deck, so you can't go all willy nilly with a humongous deck, and stronger cards cost more CP to place inside, so you have to carefully consider what to bring for the next world, or what's the most effective strategy for the upcoming boss. Cards have a numerical value from 0 to 9. You're not the only one relegated to cards in battles, the enemies play cards just as well. And in the case when you and your opponent plays cards simultaneously, the card with the higher value wins and then things move on. And this is how you primarily win battles, by playing higher numbered cards than your opponent. Though a card with a value of 0 
can break any card, even card combinations. These are known as slights. When you combine three cards to fulfill certain requirements, you can perform a special technique that has a total value of the three cards combined, thus making it harder to break. They can range from familiar techniques from the first game to fancy new abilities that decimates any opposition. Heavily relying on slights isn't the best idea though, as whenever you use one, the first card in the combination is permanently lost until the end of the battle, unless you use a special item card to restore it. Don't worry though, doesn't take long to get one of those. In fact, if all this sounds complicated, trust me, it's not because Chain of Memories is so goddamn easy to break. It's like you're playing a zero card against the game's programming, and this applies to both versions of the game. You can easily gain access to powerful spells like Blazaga as early as Traverse Town, the first world, and enemies have no chance of breaking the combination because the card value is so high. Battles normally don't last long enough for the overuse of Slice to be an issue, even in boss fights, because once you unlock the right techniques, they fall apart so fast. If you have something like the Jafar card given to you after you defeat Genie Jafar, enemies can't break your cards period for a certain time, giving you more than enough chances to really fuck their shit up. The only major annoyance as far as battling Heartless goes are those enemies that are impervious to frontal attacks like the large bodies and defenders. In the 2D game, god, getting behind them just to deal damage was an exercise in frustration. They could turn 180 degrees in a single frame. The remake obviously mitigates this by simply being in 3D and thus giving both Sora and Riku more angles to approach, so there's that at least. As far as a true challenge, Riku Riku's final battle with Ansem in the 2D game is without a doubt the hardest fight, if only because this dickhead spams attacks so fucking fast and because the arena is so small, you have little room to breathe. Now Riku is a slightly different case in battles, he has a set deck, which changes inside every world but he can't add or remove cards from his deck and has to rely on Mickey cards to heal himself since he also has no magic. And if you think this makes Riku's campaign harder, nope! After breaking enough enemy cards, Riku can transform into his dark mode, where his card attacks are super devastating, have obnoxious range, and his slight combinations tear through heartless and boss fights like tissue paper. Riku can also hold on to as many enemy cards as he pleases, unlike Sora, giving him a shitload of utility, and in the remake, Riku has this new dual mode where if he manages to break all the selected cards, he can perform a powerful attack in retaliation, which is super easy to manipulate. Though there are a variety of different slight combinations you can experiment with, Chain of Memories gives me little reason to do so since a handful of techniques are so utterly helpful, I'd have to actively limit myself to make the game somewhat difficult. When I unlocked the Sonic Blade Slight, that was it, the rest of the game was over. Skills like Tornado made quick work of Heartless Encounters since it disabled enemies until the attack finished, and stunned whatever survived. The remake breaks things even further with a selection of new slice that make quick work of whatever's in front of you. Shoutouts to Lethal Frame, which can freeze anything, ANYTHING, in place and make them easy picking. It was smooth sailing until around the final boss, where the best solution was just to cram your deck full of high numbered cards. Since since whenever you broke an enemy's card, you stopped whatever they were doing, no matter how flashy. But that's also something you can do. If slides aren't your thing, you can just fill your deck with high number cards and just spam attacks, then hit the reload button when you run out. That's the closest you'll ever get to the original battle system. And since breaking enemy cards means stopping them completely from attacking, the enemies never have a chance. And if they try and use a slight for themselves, just whip out a zero card and slap them on the wrist. Granted, to even have a deck full of high number cards requires grinding, but that's something you'll most likely find yourself doing anyway, if not for additional cards than because of the cards needed to progress through each world, which you get from winning battles. And if you don't get the cards you want, you can easily save scum until you get what you want, or I guess you can just bite the bullet and use those game-breaking slights anyway. Look, the card system is no doubt the most interesting thing about Chain of Memories, and there was something I found oddly relaxing about taking the time to construct a new deck whenever I got some new cards, probably because I like to play Yu-Gi-Oh! And hey, I wouldn't mind if this game was set up more like that. Draw! Goofy Caro! Draw! Donald Caro! Draw! Mickey Caro! But because it doesn't take much time to snap the game in half, it also takes no time for things to get really, really, really boring. And it's not just battles either, the overworlds are about as appealing as a third grade Kingdom Hearts diorama. Worlds are comprised of rooms you generate by fulfilling the room's numerical requirements using these map cards you attain by winning battles. Map cards all have numbers on them and you need the right numbers to get to the next room and progress with the story. And God help you if you don't because that means grinding heartless until you do and that is the fucking pits. In Riku's campaign, there is next to no story in his worldly visits, no Disney stuff or anything like that, making his journey even more monotonous. All of his plots happen between worlds, it's pretty empty. The room's contents depend on the type of card you use. It could be a room full of strong heartless, sleeping heartless, rooms where your cards are stronger, where you can find more friend cards or treasure containing more techniques. There's plenty to choose from, but the rooms themselves are all the same isometric boar fest that only have you jump on ledges or maybe break a lantern for some health or perhaps a card drop or smack the same type of heartless for the 30th time in that world alone. And in the remake, this is even worse because it just feels like you're playing a watered down version of the first game with none of the platforming or other interesting things to interact with. The Game Boy Advance game at least had the excuse for being on inferior hardware, so the downgrade made sense, but no matter the version, these rooms are so lifeless and 
so like one another. The backgrounds change because you travel to different worlds, obviously. And hey, there aren't any gummy ship missions at least, but is that really a balanced compromise? I don't think so. But hey, credit to 100 Acre Wood, it has absolutely nothing at all in the Game Boy Advance game. You just drag Winnie the Pooh across the field and then his friends give you cards. That's fucking fun. The remake gives you more mini games at least, nothing spectacular, but better than this shit. A few of you have noticed that I never once mentioned 100 Acre Wood in the last video. It is a world that Sora travels to, but it's always the, the mini game world that has no bearing on the story. You play games, you get some treasure, that's it. That's probably why I completely skimmed over it, but yeah, yeah. it's a thing. About as relevant as the other shit. There are things to like about Chain of Memories, but it's got too many cracks. Mechanically, I find the remake better with its refined battle system and the additional options it gives the player in combat, despite the fact that most battles put up next to no challenge, and if I have to purposely not use certain abilities to make things remotely interesting, that's a problem. The game's a total drag. The worlds are dreadfully tiring and samey. Battles can be just as bad, but ultimately needed to travel deeper into the game because you do need map cars to proceed after all. And the less I say about the story, the better. I was on autopilot for a majority of my time here. Shit, by the time I got to the end of Sora's story, I was purposely making all the rooms nothing but Moogle and treasure rooms since they don't have Heartless inside, meaning I can just go to the next room and fight the next boss. And I fully played through both versions for this review, so maybe that's why I'm just a tad bitter. But come on, Chain of Memories was always that footnote in the series. It's the only game to use the card battle system, and the plot elements it introduced were just there to be fleshed out in the game everybody was actually waiting for, Kingdom Hearts 2. I mean, they're striking when the iron's hot, I guess, but if the result is something so flimsy and needlessly confused the shit out of people, was it wasn't really worth it? I don't know. Either way, next up is the PlayStation 2 sequel, four years in the making. Four years, it's 2017, we still don't know shit about Kingdom Hearts 3's release date. Anyway. Kingdom Hearts 2. I'll see you guys next time for that. Thank you all for watching. Have yourselves a fantastic night and take care. Hey everyone, just wanted to take some time to apologize for the wait between this video and the first Kingdom Hearts video. I had a lot of things to take care of after too many games. My Let's Play channel over on the Super Gaming Brothers just broke 100,000 subscribers, so I wanted to spend some time to celebrate the occasion. And just recently, I did a collab with Cat Icarus talking about the Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy, so please give that a look here. Now I'm going to get right on Kingdom Hearts 2 because unlike Chain of Memories, I can look forward to that, and I hope you do too. Have a good night, everybody.